Hello and welcome to the Life After Diets podcast. I'm Sarah Dosanj, psychotherapist and author of the book, I Can't Stop Eating. And I'm Stephanie Michelle, binge recovery health coach. If you feel out of control around food, we get it because we've been there. Thank you for joining our conversations about how to make peace with food and feel more comfortable in our bodies. Now on to this week's episode. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the podcast. As always, I'm here with Steph. Hello, Steph. Hello, Sarah. (laughs) You were just saying before we recorded that you forgot on the last episode to ask for reviews for the podcast. Would you like to ask now? I'd love to. If you'd like to give us a review, we would really appreciate it. (laughs) (laughs) Reviews really help us out. So we appreciate anybody's rating and review if you can take a minute to do that on your favorite podcast platform. Mm -hmm. So today we were going to talk about We haven't quite got the title for this episode yet, but it's something along the lines of dieting versus healthy eating. Can you pursue healthy eating? And we're going to talk about that because it's a loaded phrase, healthy eating without dieting. Because in theory, if you followed all the health advice out there about food, it could very much look like what we might think of as orthorexia. So at what point does it become Mm -hmm. detrimental psychologically emotionally however we're going to think about that to pursue foods of a high nutritious density and this is going to be tricky isn't it Steph how to talk about these different foods in a way that doesn't keep lumping them into categories because it's such a scale right well yes it's I think the first question to say is what is healthy eating Mm -hmm. how do you think about it healthy eating when you hear it I don't know (laughs) Well, it's like you think, I think about it like in different ways. Like I think about it the way the cultural, like the the implanted definition of what I know that to mean or what I've known that to mean my whole life or what I think that means or was taught versus what I really probably think about it, Mm -hmm. really think about it now. And the difference that there's a difference, like there's this idea of healthy eating. I don't know, for some people that might mean fruits and vegetables. For some people that might mean low carb. For some people that might mean low calorie. Like there's so many different definitions of what we've been told health is over the decades Mm -hmm. of it, of the evolution of of health. What I'd been taught of healthy eating would be any foods that are in their natural state. And again, I know all this language is problematic, what we define as natural, but anything that's not processed. Again, that's problematic because Mm -hmm. what do we mean by processed? So we can go down a bit of a tunnel with this. I guess I'm thinking fruits, vegetables. I would say meats. I do eat meat. Um, and all that's going to be, yeah, of course. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. It's yeah, not yeah, processed. Yeah. I mean, it is to a degree, like everything is to a degree, but, but it's not, it's going to be under someone's health umbrella and, and completely not under someone else's. So I think that speaks to the point. I don't want to interrupt you. I want you to keep telling me what's your healthy definition, be, <laughs> but I want to qualify this. This is just talking about the idea of what a physical health diet ought to be according to the messages that I've absorbed because everything goes into our filters so many contradictory things out here so some of them really stick I can remember only it's about six seven years ago when I was still working in the police one of my sergeants was dieting and she was doing a whole low fat thing and she was about 20 years older than me and I remember thinking, oh, I can't believe she's still thinking low fat's the thing. Because you know? <laughs> that her dieting would have started in the 80s and the 90s. Yeah. That would have been the message. And it sticks, even though new things come in. Sometimes yeah. when we cling on to like, no, this is what mm-hmm. healthy eating is, or this is what dieting is, we get quite attached to our ideas. My daughter, who's 10, mm-hmm. uh, and in fifth grade, came home yet- last night. She came, came and she's like, Mom, we have we're writing persuasive essays in and we had to persuade on either side of an argument for which cereal was healthier. She said, and there was a Raisin Bran cereal. And one of the supporting pieces of evidence for why that's healthier is that it has 40% less fat than the other cereal. Oh my gosh, I had so many reactions to this, not the least of which was how old is this curriculum anyway? <laughs> like I, if they had said like low sugar, that's what's quote unquote healthy right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, they're teaching this to my 10 year old. That, that would have never even entered our consciousness as far as like the cultural conversation now. Like fat is good now in so many health circles. But yeah. I think it's also interesting that you mentioned that we're talking about healthy food as in the physical, because I think that's worth bringing in as what does healthy mean and is 
is healthy food and a healthy diet really just about the nutrient profile of a food, which is a separate conversation Mm -hmm. for that. I mean, you say it's a separate conversation. I don't think we can completely separate it because normally the first thing I do when people talk about healthy foods is, you know, we've got emotional health, we've got psychological health, mental health, kind of the same thing, social health, um, spiritual health, if you're that way inclined. And our physical health is tied in with all of those things as well. So we can't separate all these different types of health, but we're recording this. It probably won't come out till February, but we're recording this at the beginning of the year. And so a lot of people that I'm working with, they're struggling with this whole diet talk that's going on everywhere. But because there's such a strong message now in a lot of circles that dieting doesn't work, it now becomes about, well, I'm going to eat healthier. It's not a diet. I'm not dieting, but I'm going to clean up my diet or I'm going to change something to eat in a way that I think, believe that I maybe believe that I should be eating. That might be it. It's it gets complicated because I think we'll probably get into this, but the motivations are important here when it comes to what we're pursuing from a dietary perspective. I think that's everything. Like, what is the intention there? What is the motivation to eat healthy? Because I think for some, weight loss and health are so wrapped up that it is it is the same. It's mm-hmm. saying, I want to I want to eat healthy so I can lose weight mm-hmm. versus someone else who might say, I want to eat healthy because of a different reason. What reasons are you hearing? A lot of the time, people are saying it's to do with health. They want to be healthier. And then they end up checking themselves because they also recognize that in their idea of being healthier, there's often a hope of some weight loss in there as well. So then it becomes complicated because then they're bouncing between, am I doing this for health? Am I doing this to lose weight? Am I going to trigger off more binging if I get caught up in the doing it to lose weight side of things? But how do I remove the part of me that's hoping I might lose weight? This might be one of the challenges to change how you eat and make those shifts. Right. Well, I have a client who has been working to repair her relationship with food for a while and has is on solid ground who has spoken to me recently about this and who has said, I am scared of in, of eating in a way that I feel will help my energy because in the recovery process has been eating a lot of foods that she feels are depleting her energy and making her feel more sluggish. And this is something she definitively feels the difference. And she's not alone here with this desire to look at incorporating more energy giving foods, because it's scary to feel like, well, what if I jeopardize my recovery? What is the difference between this and restricting? Is this restricting if I do this? And I feel like I'd be lying to you if I didn't say that there's a part of me that wouldn't be disappointed if Mm -hmm. I lost weight too. Mm -hmm. And I think what I've conveyed back to her is that I think it would be unrealistic to say that you have to get rid of that altogether in order to eat energy giving foods. That hope existing doesn't have to be a prerequisite or, or that hope not existing doesn't have to be a prerequisite. But what's important here, and this is a big part of my gentle nutrition program that I run a couple of times a year is that we spend so much time on it's the mentality. It's the mental preparation, the mental wrapping your head around. Can that desire exist without being in the driver's seat? And when do you know when that changes? And that's the that's the critical piece, I think. I think it's about saying like, okay, I can see that this desire is there, but is that what's driving this? And really getting clear on what is driving it. Is the desire truly to gain more energy? And what would be signs that that was flip-flopping? You know, where the driver becomes something else. Um, How do you know? Mm -hmm. But haven't you ever had that time when you are eating not a lot and eating these high nutritious foods and you feel amazing with great energy for a while? You know, the, the whole classic detox thing, which is so problematic. I suppose I'm just pointing out a potential pitfall here. If you're saying, somebody's saying, okay, I'm going to focus on on feeling good and having more energy because the way I'm eating at the moment is making me feel sluggish. You can go from feeling sluggish to feeling 
like a bit of a burst of something Mm -hmm. eating very light but at some point like it trips you up further down the line and I think that 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 is the trap I suppose that I'm urging people to look out for well that's the awareness of having of, of a knowledge of when the threshold gets crossed of like now I'm beginning to feel deprived because there is I mean I've been on that high before where like the first week I did keto I felt great you know and I was like this is the answer and then oh I want that I want that bread oh wait no not having bread not having bread oh yeah we don't want the bread it's like that's the threshold that I cross and then from then on it became a slippery downward slope of like you're not allowed to have the bread we don't have bread we feel good without bread but like no longer was I feeling good with that. like there was this entrance of I want the bread <laughs> my body actually wants the bread but at that point I was so attached to the diet which is the difference when you label something, when you're on a lifestyle plan that includes such and such foods and not others, you eliminate the possibility of your body being able to speak to you in favor of following a plan or following the rules. And I think that that flexibility and the maintenance of that flexibility and the the ongoing awareness of that flexibility, um, that That is it It, because your body will change. Your needs will change depending on what you're eating. So if you're eating certain foods in abundance, your body will be like, okay, now we need some of this kind. It's not like we find this magical answer of eating and and that, and okay, we feel good for, we feel good in the first week. And now that's the answer. So we, now it will sustain. We're so fluid. Our bodies are changing in our minds too. Like the cravings we're having, the time of month we're in, like the season we're in, these things are fluid. And so being able to move with that instead of rigidly defining what healthy eating needs to look like forever Mm -hmm. and understanding that that will shift, I think is part of that process of being able to incorporate more energy giving, nutrient dense, healthy food without um, jeopardizing or, or without sliding back into rigid thinking. I know this came up very briefly once before on the podcast where you talked about if you were eating a lot of foods that don't make you feel great, oh, I never know what to call them, <laughs> um, that after a while you start to crave more nutrient-dense foods. And I never did. Yeah. You know, and there, I think there's often this assumption in the intuitive eating world that mm. If you give yourself full permission to eat all your fear foods, all the foods that you see as quote unquote bad, then eventually you are going to start craving more nutrient dense foods. And for me, Mm -hmm. I don't think it happened like that. I think to some degree I might get fed up of how those foods feel, Mm -hmm. but I still wanted them. And I still woke up the next day really wanting those foods and having to manage those cravings. And it's one of the things I'd love about gentle nutrition that was so helpful for me was about adding stuff in. Mm -hmm. The more I focus on trying not to eat those foods, I took the permission away and then I ended up going down binging again. But it was a real, it wasn't because I wanted to. There was an element of thinking I, I, I need to, I ought to because this is the way to actually find balance, not because these foods are so bad, but they're not making me feel good anymore. Right. I think that's sometimes a missed element of intuitive eating because I think it's okay. I don't think that everybody will naturally feel inclined towards those foods. I used to think that, I think, because I did. It was my experience, so I assumed Um, And the more I worked with people, the more I was realizing that that was not always the case, particularly for people who had never had, like they grew up on certain kinds of foods and not so much produce. I have one client who said, I never had a vegetable until I was 23. So I think to to intentionally inject it is sometimes like, yeah, that's, you don't have to wait necessarily, but then it feels like, well, is that dieting then? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the question. It becomes like, is consciously choosing food instead of waiting for my body to intuitively want it wrong, you know, and I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. I don't in Mm -hmm. it provided that a context is a certain way. I think that it can be, I think it it has the potential to be a diet, Mm -hmm. Um, but this is the distinction of knowing when it is and when it isn't and all the shades in between 
And the point I want to make about it is that it may not be easy. I know for me, when I've been eating a lot of processed foods uh, for several days, weeks in a row, those first few days when I intentionally were injecting foods with a high nutrient density, those foods didn't taste good to me. They didn't taste satisfying because I'd been eating all these other kinds of foods, which are very stimulating. And then eating these other foods, they just didn't really seem to have much about them, but it did pass. But those first couple of days were uncomfortable. And if I didn't stick with that, then I could slip back into this cycle of getting caught up with these kinds of foods again. So I think it might be that some people want to introduce some more nutrition, but whenever they do, they think, well, I don't enjoy it and I don't feel satisfied. And that thwarts their effort. It's disappointing because mm -hmm. we're trying to find satisfaction. We need that satisfaction from food in order to be able to feel balanced and regulated. We hope you're enjoying this episode of the podcast. We just want to take a minute of your time to let you know we're now on Patreon. If you would like to support our work and be a part of our growing community, please head to patreon.com forward slash life after diets. All of our patrons are invited to join us in our Life After Diets private Facebook group to connect with us and other like-minded souls. For more details about how to contact us or to work with Sarah or Steph individually, please check out the show notes. Now let's get back to the episode. One of the things you said, I think, in a previous episode was that the more of those foods you have, the more you'll want them mm -hmm. um, and vice versa. Well, of, e of either food. Mm -hmm. And so um, I guess my question would be to you because I I enjoy those foods pretty quick right away. Um, but if, if you don't, I suppose that would be where it would feel the most critical of eating something you're not deriving a lot of satisfaction from within those days, you know, and how do you manage your mind when you're feeling like I'm doing this and I don't even want this thing, or I'm not necessarily finding pleasure in this thing. Does it feel obligatory then? And does that lend itself to feeling like a diet? Hmm. I don't know that it feels obligatory. I think the motivation behind it usually came from, I'm fed up of feeling as sluggish as I've been feeling. And I would stick at it with the hope that I'm going to be rewarded in a couple of days by wanting more of these foods, by getting into a more regulated pattern, by having meals. Whereas when I was in these cycles of binging on processed foods, it was this, it could be this elongated eating that wasn't punctuated by meals. So I think there's something as well, I suppose, in the, the intention where it really did feel like it was from a place of self-care. Yeah. And it wouldn't be, okay, I've been eating all these kinds of processed foods and now I'm going to eat all these nutritious foods and I'm not allowed to eat any of the processed foods at the same time. I don't think I could have made that jump. I think I would have had something akin to a very strong withdrawal from those kinds of foods if I did that. That's what it felt like. I'm conscious of the language there, but it's really hard to find another word that fits to how it felt. So what would normally happen is the first day, you know, I would have planned meals I try and find the stuff that I know I generally really enjoy. And there would be some stuff added on top. There'd be some processed foods added on top of that. And then the next day I made sure I had those meals again. And then it would just take a couple of days to feel a bit more balanced and regulated again. So that the balance had, had shifted from right. what could be 80% a very sort of process. I really don't like using the word process. I can't find another one. 80% a very processed diet to more of that being these kinds of foods that supported me, supported my energy and how I felt. And then I would feel much more satisfied because binging on the other foods wasn't satisfying either. Yeah. Well, I think it really calls into question, like, do you feel definitively better eating those foods? What, what is the benefit of eating them? And do you feel that, or is it something that is, it is, um, a belief. So if there is a, a strongly felt sense of I have more energy when I eat X, Y, and Z, and I feel sleepier in general when I'm eating more of A, B, and C, you know, is that actually, was that actually happening for you mm -hmm. in a felt physical sense? Because that to me would be the motivation, like the, a truer sense of self care. Like my the idea that I was supporting myself would feel so much more compelling 
if it was actually a felt experience of being supported rather than like, I, I think I should be eating these things, but I really can't tell the difference between mm-hmm. when I eat them and when I don't. I think when I was binging, I would get these bursts of energy from these foods, you know, something akin to a bit of a high and I could use it to motivate myself to do things. And then when I wasn't, and when I sort of shifted into more, um, a greater proportion of nutritious foods, that kind of balanced out. So there was a sense of missing that burst of energy, but then it balanced out because I didn't have to deal with the crashing lows as well. It was like coming off the roller coaster and leveling out which is a relief when you feel sick from being on the roller coaster, but then it can start to get a bit Mm -hmm. boring, you know, and I seek the high again and then off I go. Yeah. So then it's about, I, to me, then it becomes a lot about the extremism. And I think when we're dieting, there's an extremism. It's even if it's cloaked in, like I'm thinking with Weight Watchers where you're like allowed to eat certain things. It's like, you're allowed to technically eat all foods, but there's parameters there. Um, and just the idea when you're eating in a way that really is self-supportive, that it doesn't have necessarily like predetermined parameters about like, well, I can't have a cookie or I can't have too many of, I, for me, like eating is so it ebbs and flows so much. It's like, there's certain days and weeks or even months where it's, it feels generally good and over here and having these types of things. And then that will shift. And it, it's kind of going with that rather than saying, this is the way I need it to look. And I need it to stay like that. And that to me is the diet mentality. It's Mm -hmm. versus being able to move with your needs and to check in on them and adjust them as needed, you know, to me, that's that's a big difference. That idea of self-supportive eating, I think, is a, an interesting turn of phrase. I suppose I was thinking self-supporting a future me, because actually, if I did what felt self-supporting in the moment, I would carry on reaching for the same binge foods because I did feel better in the moment and it did feel like a way of supporting myself and feeling okay Mm. but there was in order to move beyond that a sense of having to deprive that part of me and that's a tricky word when we're using that around food but to deprive that part of me that wanted to feel that way in the moment so that I can feel better and if, if, if the feeling better happened would take weeks then I don't think I could have done it but because the, the leveling out, it would normally happen pretty quickly, less than two days, probably. But that same tactic is used by fitness culture. I and know. Say, you know, like, yeah, I heard it. Diet culture. Yeah. Of like eat the way you want to feel like do it for the future you. Yeah. So what's the difference? Because I'm not seeking this salvation that I'm going to be good enough in the future. It's not because I need to change something fundamentally about myself, which is what the dieting is I have to change my body in order to feel better this was just I want to feel better I'm so unhappy now and I want to feel better and the difference was is that I would actually feel better Hmm. by doing that it it worked and it would turn out to be a self-supporting cycle that these these periods of time got longer and longer with the difference then being it's feeling better versus looking better quote unquote is, I mean, it, does it come down to the motivation of feeling versus the motivation of looking? Well, there's feeling because there's feeling from a worthy perspective. I'm dieting because I think I will be, I will feel worthier. Mm -hmm. This wasn't, this was an energy thing. This was a, a mood issue. So feeling better was about actually feeling well. Whereas diets are not about, oh, you will finally feel well in six months down the line if you stick to this plan. Yeah. So how do you distinguish that? Because a diet then is the pursuit of improving one's mood, at least in theory. It's like saying that if you look good, you'll feel better about yourself. Well, then it comes back to the definition of health. By doing what I was doing, I felt physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, spiritually all of those healthier. If a diet gives you all those five things, crack on, go and do a diet. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, is it, it doesn't. Right. 
<laughs> right. right. I think it does have the potential to improve your mood to a degree, right? That, that like band-aid of like, I feel worthy in the moment because I looked in the mirror and I feel all right, or I fit into these pants. Yeah. But how long does that last? And also it's not hitting the other buckets. Mm -hmm. um, there's often a depletion. Mm -hmm. So I think it's about look again, zooming out and looking at that holistic sense of, of health as part of all of and including all those other structures rather than I just feel momentarily powerful or confident um, yeah. in the way that I look and that depends on the way that I look. Yeah. And the other difference being my body didn't need to change at all for me to feel better. Right. So one of the questions I ask people is I say, like, if eating this way were to not change your body, if it won't change your body one little bit, would you still be doing it? Yes. I had to yeah. get to that point because it wouldn't right. have been possible. I think to have done it until I could answer that question. Right. Yes. Without any resistance coming up towards it. Yeah. Right. I think that's the question to keep assessing. Yes. Good one, Steph. Let me write that down. <laughs> <laughs> There's often a temporary-ness to diets as well. Not always. Sometimes it can be like this is a way of eating and you're supposed to eat like this all the time. But a lot of the traditional dieting is this very temporary. Follow this plan, hit your goal weight, there you are. I think the challenge for a lot of people when maybe wanting to make health promoting changes in what they're actually choosing to eat comes from historically changing the way you eat has only been associated with dieting. It's almost like you don't have this framework for what it means to choose something because we, mm, that knowledge, <laughs> we abuse the knowledge of mm. nutrition. Yeah. I think as dieters, we abuse that knowledge. We turn it into rules. We let the rules tell us how we're supposed to feel, what we're supposed to do, what the outcome should be. So I think it's tricky. This is really new territory for anybody with a history of dieting to be consciously wanting or trying to make different food choices that are driven by physical health. Yeah, there's not really a, it's so easy to revert and it's the only template we have until we chart a new one. Mm -hmm. And we have to talk about the gray with this, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Because the minute we start introducing rules and turning it into black and white, that that's when I think there's going to be mm. difficulties. I had to keep my structure so flexible with options to change my mind and all kinds of caveats that I'm definitely allowed this and I'm allowed that and all these reassurances in order to be able to make any conscious decisions to change the way I ate. How was that gray? What do you mean? So let's say I'd been in a binge cycle and I was making plans to introduce more nutritious foods the next day. If I start writing out a plan and saying, okay, breakfast is going to be this lunch, dinner, and these are my two snacks and that's what I'm going to eat. That was just never going to happen. It had to be really fluid, really flexible. It, it would be something like, yeah. okay, for breakfast, yeah, I think that's probably what I'll have for breakfast. For lunch, I can have that. For dinner, I can have that. But if I get to lunch and I don't want that, but there's something else I actually genuinely fancy, then there's always an option to change my mind. There was always an option to go back and have more. Um, because the minute I started taking those permissions away from myself, even the minute I even thought about taking those permissions away yeah. from myself, yes. something was triggered. It's rigidity. Mm -hmm. It's rigidity. I think the difference is rigidity. Mm -hmm. Well, one of them and, and versus flexibility. And yeah. it's easy to want to, I think if you're, if you tend towards rigid, if rigid makes you feel more in control or, or more organized, and then it's easy to slide and to become rigid. So what, for me, it's, what are your signs of rigidity? What are mm -hmm. those, what are those um, indications for you that that is happening? And also it brings up when you're just talking, what about meal planning? Like is meal planning something you can do when you're not dieting? Is it slippery? Well, I think to have no idea of what you're going to have for any of your meals sets you up for having to make a lot of food decisions throughout the day. And if food is a stressful area for you, I think you're setting yourself up. I think having options mm -hmm. and ideas, but if you wake up in the morning and you don't have a clue, if mm -hmm. it's working for you, carry on. But if, if you're finding that your day keeps getting derailed, then right. having some idea, 
having yeah. a plan it's not bad yeah I, that's something I, I get a lot of a lot of people asking or, or saying I that they almost feel like they can't meal plan because that was something they did in their dieting days and it really was helpful and they feel afraid to do that and so I think giving permission giving oneself permission like and openly saying like no I think I think meal planning has a place to, it's really about who you are I mm-hmm. think, and like the way you run, um, but that it's definitely not, doesn't just have to be a diety thing. And I, again, it comes back to the fact that meal planning traditionally, I think you can't even look up, you can't Google meal plan without, without it being attached to so, diets. It's the narrative of dieting is meal planning and, mm-hmm. and vice versa. And so it's about, there's so much reinvention here because this isn't charted, because nobody doesn't diet, like since the dawn of dieting, you know, nobody doesn't anymore um, until now, right? There isn't a lot of navigating these waters without a diet lens. So Mm -hmm. it's new. And I think so much of it is intuition too around, what do you think? Like, how does it feel to you? How do you know that this is not dieting? How does that personally present because we don't have we don't have a lot of of leadership around that, or we don't have a lot of books talking about that, or magazine articles for sure talking about that. Um, so we have to make this up as we go, um, and then share. You know, I think that's what we're doing mm-hmm. um, is trying to share like how this is working, and it can be done. I, I really, really, really think that. I think that's the next phase of the non diet conversation is learning how to bring it all together. Um, So it's not just about the rebellion of dieting, but also the integration of self-supportive foods and nutrient dense foods in a way that's completely Mm non-threatening. So was yours very conscious? You went all in Mm -hmm. and then at some point your eating balances out and were there conscious decisions and plans that you had to make to support that process? No. No, because I naturally do enjoy I, I my the way I eat now is such a balance. It's all of that. It's all of these foods. And I do intuitively feel it. I do intuitively want nutritious food and also processed food. I'm sorry for the we, we have yet to come up with the lingo. Um, and I'll have it all when I feel inclined to. The only thing that sometimes there has been, um, like, for example, as I mentioned, over the holidays, I was having a lot more cookie, like a lot more sleepy food. Um, (laughs) Sleepy food. (laughs) And you know what? I can eat that for a while without it getting to me. I actually don't feel the physical effects of that for quite some time, but it started to at the end. Um, And the second I felt that, it also sometimes will affect my digestion, which is newer. That's a newer symptom I have, but I have noticed it. And when those things were starting to happen, then it was more of like an, okay, I feel the signs, I feel blue and okay. Cause it becomes easier to keep eating them because they're around and like, you know, they're easy and they're good. But I really was like, all right, I generally have more greens than this and I have more blueberries, you know, or whatever. And I'm ready for that now. And so, yes, there was some kind of consciousness, like I want to do that now. So I'm going to, but it was brought on by getting there in an organic way well one of the sticking points for me and my hunch is that some of the listeners will uh, resonate with this the part that made it difficult to consciously make choices ahead of time or have any kind of plan was because I didn't want to think about food I was just fed up of thinking about food of dealing with food it was just another life admin thing so to have to plan even plan as much as to be able to do a shop to buy foods in because every time you go into a shop there's food planning going on you're planning what you're going to eat regardless of whether you've mapped anything out I didn't want to do it and sometimes the exhaustion of binging would keep me in that place longer because it just felt like too much effort Mm. it felt too hard it felt yeah it was just too much and that was a big part of it and something that I do now just because again I hate going to the supermarket I just think it's such a chore it's nothing I that it. I enjoy about it whatsoever <laughs> I put it off and I put it off and I go to the little stores but getting the recipe boxes delivered has just been an absolute mm. 
game changer. So I look and I did it today. So I picked out a few meals for next week and they'll arrive next Tuesday. And so yesterday, one of the things that I had, it wasn't that it tasted bad. It was fine. It was this curried um, chicken pak choy noodle thing, but it wasn't what I wanted. I ate it and I thought, I'm not enjoying this. And I don't even know why I'm not enjoying it because it doesn't taste bad, but I'm not enjoying it. Mm. But that's okay now. And I noticed that and I kind of go like, oh, this is a shame. This is a disappointment. In the past, I would have felt hard done by because I I don't, I didn't enjoy it. So now I need to have something I do enjoy. Let me go and um, get a load of food to do that. And I'd feel really disappointed as well if I didn't enjoy my food. There was so much importance placed on how food made me feel. And trying to like undo that was a big part of Mm -hmm. my journey. Mm. That's a big one. I think, do you think that's more of a time factor of like where you get to the place of feeling like it's okay if not every meal is perfectly satisfying? Well, it came when I made, because I think an an important part of my recovery was making the decision that I wanted to get better at feeling those difficult feelings. So it came to recognizing what dissatisfaction felt like and moving toward it and going, this is uncomfortable, but I want to be like as an identity statement, I want to be the kind of person that's good at feeling Mm -hmm. uncomfortable. And those are the kind of things I would say, because before that, before that shift, I would just catastrophize every bad feeling. And that was so problematic for me. So it's not getting to a place where you don't care and or like, and I'm not always brilliant at it. Sometimes I want to go and distract myself and I don't just sit there with my feelings as we've talked about, but I name it and I ground it. And I was like, yes, I'm feeling dissatisfied. What a shame. (laughs) <laughs> How does this feel? Yeah, I accept it. I don't want to accept it. Yeah, I'll accept it because the alternative of not accepting the feeling is worse. Mm-hmm. So considering this is a meal, and this is a meal, <laughs> <laughs> considering this is an episode about meals and meal planning, Steph, have you got any takeaways for the listener? Uh, I think clarifying that eating in a way that incorporates nutrition or that considers nutrition is not an anti anti diet thing, or it's not an anti intuitive eating thing. And that giving ourselves permission to do that can be as welcome of a relief as giving yourself permission to eat anything. Um, But that for me, this is it comes down to keeping some questions in mind for oneself of ask of of staying abreast of the that's a funny word of staying What's another word? (laughs) Keep it, keep it, keep Keep it. it. I like it. Yeah. Okay. Staying abreast of the intentions and um, particularly around it changing your body size and also replacing rigidity with flexibility and removing the obsession and the identification with what usually a company is dieting. Um, I think this is the crux of it. Mm -hmm. And to leap off that, because it was your first point anyway, but I I just want to spell the question out again for people. Would you be willing to carry on eating this way if your body never changed? I think if you can honestly answer yes to that question, then chances are it's not coming from a diet mentality place. Mm -hmm. Sound right? Yeah. Yeah. Great. So thank you for joining our conversations. And if you could leave us a rating and review, we would greatly appreciate it. And until next time, thanks. Yeah, And if you struggle to write a review, remember you can just say, <laughs> nice ladies, worth a listen. Five stars. There you go. I've written the review for you. It'll take you like 10 Do all the work. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Bye. Okay.